everybody. I'm so excited today to have with me Dr. Craig Keener from Asbury Seminary, and he's a, a New Testament scholar. He's written an awful lot, and he's been in our past uh, engagements with Patterns of Evidence, the Red Sea Miracle. But here we're going to be talking to him about the seven churches of Revelation, times of fire. So I want to ask you the first question. Why is the book of Revelation important? The book of Revelation is the climax of the canon. So it's, I mean, we, we still hear from God in prayer and as we read scripture and so on, but in terms of canonical revelation, it's, you know, it's the last thing we get until Jesus comes back. So the book of Revelation is the climax and it's full of practical themes. It's full of, of a message of hope for us. I mean, you look at how heaven is portrayed in the book of Revelation. You have uh, the Ark of the Covenant in 1119. You have the Tabernacle of Testimony in chapter 15. You have the Altar of Sacrifice in chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. You have an Altar of Incense in chapter 8. Um, heaven is, is basically portrayed like a temple and like the tabernacle. So uh, also the Sea of Bronze, or well, Sea of Bronze in the temp temple and uh, Sea of Glass in the book of Revelation. It's being portrayed as a temple. And what do you do in a temple? You worship. And so we're never as close to heaven in this life as we are, as when, we, when we're worshiping God. And, and also like Revelation chapter 21, the New Jerusalem is shaped like a cube. Um, it's, it's shaped like the Holy of Holies in the Old Testament. So we will dwell in his presence, undistracted forever and ever. And, and our, our own intimacy with him, now it just foreshadows the perfect intimacy that we'll have with him then. It's, it's a book of, of great hope. So to those who are suffering, it says, hang in there. Jesus is worth waiting for. He has, he has so much in store for us. And it's also a, a warning because, you know, some churches are suffering and they really need hope. They really need the encouragement that they will be vindicated. And then there are other churches that are kind of compromising with the same world system that is killing our brothers and sisters elsewhere in the world. And those churches need to be reminded also that a day is coming when all the things that we value in this world are going to be gone. And the one thing that will last forever is whatever we've done for Jesus and our relationship with Jesus. So it's a, it's a message that, that summons us to wake up, the sleeping dead church like Sardis, and that encourages the suffering churches like Smyrna and Philadelphia that he's got our back. I know that there are different views about when are we taken up into heaven. I grew up uh, with a tradition that was pre-tribulation, pre-trib. There's a mid-trib and there's a, a post-trib. And I'm just curious, uh, what what is your understanding? Because I'll just say this, there are people right now that are in tribulation. Uh, they're, they're, they're going through a horrible tribulation right now in different parts of the world. So they're in the tribulation, right? Uh, so the question then is, uh, uh, just give me some insight uh, after you've you've done you've written a commentary on Revelation, so I'd like to understand uh, your understanding. There there have been major views uh, differing about the thousand year period in Revelation chapter twenty. So the earliest church fathers seem to have been premillennial, believing in the future thousand years. Uh, from Augustine onward, and actually before Augustine, the dominant view was amillennial, where we are in the, the thousand years now. It's symbolic. Uh, Luther and Calvin held that view. So um, post-millennial, that Jesus comes back at the end of the thousand years, that view actually was the dominant view among the uh, leaders of the Great Awakenings in the U.S. So what we're talking about with, with these things, I mean, we have men and women of God who've held each of these views through history. But up until the early 1800s, nobody actually believed that the church would be raptured out before the tribulation. The idea that the church wouldn't go through the tribulation rather than that the church was either in or about to go through it seems to have arisen somewhere in the early 1800s. It was popularized by John Nelson Darby, who argued 
that God doesn't deal with the church and with Israel at the same time. Of course, since 1948, a lot of people wouldn't agree with that. But in any case, um, th this view, once, once he came up with it, they came up with verses to defend that position. So today, among those who believe in a future thousand years, those who believe in a future tribulation before that thousand years tend to fall into one of those three groups that you mentioned. Pre-tribulational, Jesus raptures the church before the tribulation, raptures the church in the middle of the tribulation, or just raptures the church when he comes back at his second coming before the thousand years. There are people who love Jesus who hold each of these views, so I'm not putting anybody down. But I was originally taught that the church would be raptured before the tribulation. And as I studied each of the passages in context, I found that none of them actually said that. So, um, I mean, even, even you look at the very structure of Revelation, the first description of Jesus coming back happens in chapter 19. And if you take the view that the thousand years is future, the the first resurrection, and, and it's called the first resurrection, happens at the beginning of the thousand years. It doesn't happen at the beginning of, of tribulation. All through the book of Revelation, we see God's people suffering, uh, being being persecuted, uh, protected from God's God's actions of anger towards towards their persecutors, but the church itself is is suffering. And you look elsewhere in the New Testament as well. I mean, Second Thessalonians chapter 1 talks about when we will be delivered from our tribulation, from our suffering. It does say we, we will be delivered when Jesus comes back, but it also identifies when that time will be. It says when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire, dealing out retribution to those who don't know God and to those who don't obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Well, then the next chapter goes on. It does talk about a restrainer of lawlessness being being taken out. And there are debates, because there are different views about who that restrainer is or what that restrainer is. But one thing that shouldn't be debatable, it does say that before that day comes of our gathering together to him, his coming and our gathering to him, will be that there'll be a falling away and the man of lawlessness will be revealed will set himself up in the temple. So, again, there's different views on exactly what that constitutes, what that means, but it seems like Jesus' coming is after that and not before that. Again, you look at Matthew 24 and Mark 13, and Jesus' coming there, the only coming that's described and the only gathering of God's people that's described is after the tribulation, and it's explicitly after the tribulation. So, I mean, I could I could run through all the different texts, but probably the best thing for somebody to do, if they're curious about it, is just to look through all the all the verses that people cite and look them up in context and see do they really say that. Now, having said that, whichever view a person holds. We're looking for the coming of Jesus. That's what matters most. But we also recognize until Jesus comes back, we may suffer. So whether you think you get out of the last three and a half years of suffering or the last seven years of suffering, nobody has a guarantee of getting out of suffering. We've had so many generations and so many people in so many parts of the world today who are suffering for their faith and dying for their faith. So... We just need to be ready to suffer because Jesus is worth that. He's worth everything. Uh, to be honest with you, Craig, I'm concerned about uh, a number of believers that might be discouraged if they see persecution or if they don't have an under, if they have an understanding that might be, you know, incorrect. Uh, will they lose heart or will they lose faith uh, in in the Lord because they're going through suffering and. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it, you know what I'm getting at here, because there's there is a sort of a, an American understanding that uh, in, in Christian Christianity that that uh, uh, we're not going to suffer. Yeah, and I mean this this happens with end time views. It also happens with uh, particular views about how God wants us to be happy and 
prosperous and, and so on. And it's great when, you know, Paul says, I know both how to be abased and how to abound. I mean, I'm happy that we have opportunities here for, for the gospel and for advancing the study of scripture and so on. But we do have to recognize that it's not like our brothers and sisters who are suffering in other parts of the world, that that's, that that's unique. I mean, I felt years ago when I was praying, like God was, God was saying that there was coming a time when he was going to strip us in the U.S. and in North America, strip us of the things that we value so we could learn to value what really matters in his sight. And I think a lot of believers in the world, they have an understanding of that because they've lost so much for Jesus. And they found in their sufferings that Jesus is enough. And the sufferings I've gone through, that's also what I what I discovered. You know, they can take other things away from us. Well, if you look at, uh, if I'm allowed to cite um, that old Prince of Egypt cartoon, <laughs> they can't take away from us our faith. That's the one thing that nobody can take. Thank you. Well, in the Church of Ephesus, one of the things that happened there was that they had they had lost their first love, and uh, it's easy to get comfortable. And I mean, they were really a championing church. They did a lot of great things, but they lost their first love. Uh, t let's talk just about that. Uh, it's easy to get sort of complacent, isn't it, in our faith? Yeah, yeah. And there's there's um there are a couple different views about what that means about losing the first love because it's it doesn't explicitly say whether it's we lost our first love towards God or we lost our first love towards one another and since it's not explicit it may actually mean generally we lost our first love that is in both ways because um, John wrote a letter uh, probably a more circular letter than than the letter that Jesus had him sent to Ephesus. But in 1 John chapter 4, he says that whoever doesn't love doesn't know God because God is love. And he says whoever claims to love God and yet hates their brother or sister is, is a liar. And that may be significant in the church in Ephesus. I mean, they, 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 they were good in terms of, of sorting out false doctrine, getting rid of false doctrine. But sometimes, and this doesn't necessarily follow, because I think we need to be careful about having right teachings. Wrong teachings always end up causing trouble. But sometimes we can get really purist about right doctrine and forget about loving our brothers and sisters who may disagree with us on this or that issue. One way to express our love for God is to express it to one another. And sometimes that means giving each other some room when we disagree. That's excellent. The, the, the next church we could talk about is the Church of Smyrna. And, uh, you know, it said, be faithful even to the point of death. And we th I oftentimes think of the Church of Smyrna, uh, you know, uh, as, as being what's happening to churches overseas right now. Yeah, in many parts of the world. I have friends in northern Mozambique, and just thousands of people have died. Hundreds of thousands have become displaced from from their lands, you know, totally dependent on the others to provide them food, and not always enough food to go around. I mean, northern Nigeria, stuff like that has been going on for years. So many places where our brothers and sisters are are suffering persecution, sometimes martyrdom. And the church in Smyrna has a lot to, to teach us. And it's a church of contrasts. Jesus speaks to them. He says, I'm the first and the last, the one who is dead and now is alive. So that's a, an encouragement to them. He holds history and he overcame death. And then he tells the church in Smyrna, you be faithful to death and I'll give you a crown of life. The churches in Smyrna and Philadelphia are the only ones that aren't rebuked for anything. And whether it's because suffering churches make you count the cost, or counting the cost and really being sold out to Jesus makes you more apt to suffer, either way, 
these are the two churches that are unconditionally approved by Jesus. So it's not to say we should try to get persecuted. That's, that's not the point. But we also should be ready for it. I know even here in the U.S., people don't think it'll happen here. But you, you start getting serious about sharing your faith. It hasn't happened to me for years. But a few decades ago, there were times when I was sharing Christ with people on the street, and I was beaten. That happened about three times, and had my, my life threatened a few times. If we're telling people about Jesus, some people will happily receive the message, and some people will be very unhappy about the message. Let's talk about the Church of Pergamum, and that's in a very unique uh, set, setting there. You know, it's, a, it's this connection with Satan's throne. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Well, in the New Testament, it does speak of kind of regions where uh, certain spiritual powers have, have more influence, and it looks like the church in uh, Pergamum had to deal with, you know, being right in the heart of one of those kinds of areas. So their witness was very important. And somebody, Antipas, had already given his life for the gospel there. And he had been a faithful witness. The same thing Jesus calls himself in Revelation chapter 1, Antipas is called. At the same time, the churches in Pergamum and Thyatira are also compromising with the same world system that's persecuting the churches in places like Smyrna and Philadelphia. We read about in these two churches uh, false prophets or prophetesses, Balaam and Jezebel. That's probably not what their parents named them. You know, those are symbolic nicknames. But they're telling the church, okay, it's all right to commit sexual immorality. It's, it's all right to compromise with idolatry. Well, that would take some of the pressure off them if they did the same thing as the values of the world around them. But Jesus warns them that the people are telling them these things. That's, that's false prophecy. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that Jesus is worth everything, and we need to live wholly and entirely for him. John was told in the first chapter, it says, Write, therefore, what you've seen, what is now, and what will take place later. That has a lot of meanings, but do the letters to the seven churches... Uh, the types of things that are happening there, do they apply to us today? Yeah, definitely. I mean, as you said, the things that were, that are, and the things that are coming. So they they apply. And, and also, you know, in terms of the last days, the way that phrase is used elsewhere in the New Testament, I mean, in Acts 2.17, in the last days, God says, I'll pour out my spirit in all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, and so on. Well, when, when Peter paraphrases Joel that way, it was already the last days on the day of Pentecost. The same phrase is used for present times in 1 Timothy 4, 2 Timothy 3, 1 Peter 1, 2 Timothy 3, 1 John 2, 18. You've heard that an Antichrist is coming. Even now, he says, there are many Antichrists. Or even in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. So until Jesus comes back, we're still in the period in between the, the first and the second coming. And the culture has changed since the first century. I mean, a lot of my work is on cultural background, uh, trying to explain some things that people may not be familiar with because the culture has changed so much. But the human heart and the plans of God are still the same. And so it says to each of the seven churches in Asia Minor, let the one who has ears hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Each church got what was most specific to them. At the same time, each church is also called to, in a sense, read the other's mail, to hear what the Spirit says to all the churches. And today as well, we can learn from what the Spirit said to all those churches, because the Spirit is still speaking to us in our settings, which are very comparable to those churches settings. Let's just uh, close with this idea. Uh, what does it mean, are you ready? What do you think uh, it means to be ready uh, for the return of Christ? Uh, what does it mean to be ready for Jesus coming? Well, you have passages like 2 Peter 3.14, since you're looking forward to 
the coming of the day of God, looking forward to it and, and hastening it. Make every effort to be found spotless and blameless before him. Titus chapter 2, looking for the, the blessed hope, the appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. He says, in light of that, say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. So if we really believe that Jesus is, is coming back, then we need to live in light of eternity. We need to we need to make our decisions in light of what they'll look like a million or a billion years from now. What difference can we make in this world for the honor of our Lord Jesus in, in light of the hope that's laid before us? The book of Revelation, you know, it talks about the, the seven churches and these seven major cities in Western Asia Minor. But there are two other cities that are mentioned in the book of Revelation that are very important. And these are symbolic cities. I mean, you, you have to you have to know they're symbolic when you look at Revelation 11, 8. And the, the city, the great city, which elsewhere is called Babylon in Revelation, is also called Sodom, Egypt, and where our Lord was crucified. Well, Babylon, Sodom, Egypt, and Jerusalem are not geographically identical, but they, they symbolize the same thing in this context in terms of in terms of the values of the world system. So in Revelation, you've got these two cities. You've got Babylon depicted as a prostitute and decked out with gold and pearls. And then you have the New Jerusalem depicted as a bride adorned for her husband and not just decked out with gold, but the city is built of gold, the streets are of gold, not just decked out with pearls, but the very gates are pearls. The prostitute has nothing on the bride. Not even, not even worth comparing. Well, those who are, are faithful, those who really trust God's promise, are those who will not settle for the temporary gratification of a prostitute, but we will be the pure bride of Christ. If we're willing not to live for the values of this age, but to live instead for God's promise in Jesus Christ. So how should people pray in uncertain times? In terms of how people should pray in uncertain times, actually, Jesus answers that question in, in Luke chapter 18, when he told a parable about how people should pray and not faint. Uh, he talks about a, an unjust judge who wasn't known for, for giving justice, but this widow kept pestering him and pestering him. And finally, he gave her what she was asking because she kept pestering him. And Jesus' point is not that God is an unjust judge. He's not. The point is rather, if an unjust judge would do this, how much more can you trust your Heavenly Father to do this? And yet at the end of that, Jesus says, and yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? In other words, God will hear our cries, but we have to be willing to hang in there because God's time is not always our time. And we can see that, you know, we're still here. It's been a long time. Jesus said he's coming soon, but uh, it's kind of like in the Chronicles of Narnia when Aslan says, I call all times soon. Prophets have been saying that since like the 8th century BC. So by the time of the New Testament, they really understood what it meant to say he's coming soon. It means his coming is imminent. It means you don't know the day nor the hour. You just be ready. The time of vindication is coming. Hang in there. Don't lose heart. But he is coming. And we just need to always be ready. What do you want people to know about the return of Christ? 1 Corinthians 13, 12 says that there's coming a day when we will know even as we are known and when we'll see him face to face. And Ephesians 2, 7 says that in all the ages to come, he's going to show us the riches of his, his love towards us, the riches of his grace towards us. What a hope we have to live for. He's already, uh, Paul says elsewhere, that, that he's given us the down payment of the Spirit, the first installment of our future inheritance, so that because God's Spirit is in our hearts, he keeps reassuring us and stirring in us that hope. And that's, that's the greatest hope of all, because someday we will see our Lord, the one who gave his life for us, the one who 
who lives in our hearts, we'll see him face to face. Thank you, Dr. Craig. I really appreciate uh, the time again. I know you're very busy, but uh, uh, very wise words. Thank you so much.